we will now go into our second part, which is uh, Lagrange. So we're doing Lagrange, and uh, I'd like to try to mostly finish Lagrange today, except for a few examples. I'm still struggling with one note, so I don't have. I'm just struggling, but I'll eventually figure it out, Robert. One of these days, I forgot to grab my notes from last time. So we were looking at that double pendulum, and I, I believe we finished the double. So we were looking at that double pendulum. Okay, and this will be a tad bit disruptive. You guys have your notes here. I'll have to take a second and reconstruct a few things. We had the two masses, we just called them M's. We had the two lengths, we just called those L. We had uh, frames. Does this look like what you have in your notes? A frames of B1, B2, C1, C2? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you called the C, you called the two the, the numbers. Oh, okay. yeah, let me make it match. So the C1, C2. <coughs> and we had a theta, and I believe our angle phi was relative. We used a relative angle set. And let me jot down, what am I, I need? I need the velocities. So let me jot down what we had from the velocities, because I, I want to do another example based on this. So our, V1, yeah, body one, V1, and then uh, B2, say that L, B1, okay, and V dot in the uh, C1. And then if we wrote that all in the in the, uh, let's see, did we write it in the B frame or the C frame? Okay, in the B frame it was theta dot L, wait, wait, okay. It was L theta dot plus V dot, S V, is that right? No, cosine V. Plus, uh, okay, plus L theta dot plus V dot sine V. Correct? That was in the V1 and V2. Is that what you had? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we're, we're L theta, L theta plus phi dot, B1, yep. Yeah, yeah. I think, that, I think that's consistent. And then plus a zero in the B3. So, you know, since you're mentioning that here, if I write it, I say in matrix, as an array, I'm just assuming that my B1 coordinate goes first, my B2 goes second, and B3 goes third. Those are equivalent ways of writing this. So my B would be uh, L theta dot plus L theta dot plus V dot C V. Does that match what you have? Okay. So those are, I look at those as fully equivalent ways to express this. Uh, we had the kinetic, we had the uh, kinetic terms, we had the uh, potential terms, and then we got our two Lagrange's equations. Um, did you notice when I do Lagrange, see I didn't have you in front of me here, so I have you now. So I just want to, you know, when I set these up, I work my way through. So I say J is one. In this case, I have J, you know, I have little n is two. So I have two degrees of freedom, two generalized coordinates. When I write Lagrange's equations, so far we're assuming that the terms are all independent. So I write those equations uniquely for each 
generalized coordinate. Here I'm looking at generalized coordinate one, where Q equals theta. Here I looked at generalized coordinate two, where basically Q2 is phi. And I just did the repetitive math. There were, there were a few questions about taking the partials, um, the derivatives with respect to individual terms. Remember the terms that we had, the first one was the partial of t with respect to, in this case, theta. Then we had the partial of t with respect to theta dot. Then we had the ddt of the partial of t with respect to theta dot. Now you could do these in, I suppose, any order, although obviously I need to do this one first before I do this guy, right? Because the parentheses show that I have the partial of e with respect to theta, and then I had the q, I had to come up with the q sub theta. So those are the five terms that I had. There were some questions, and I think you, everyone got on track. But here I'm taking, you know, here I'm, well, here I'm taking a derivative with respect to theta. It's a partial. I'm taking the derivative of the theta. I'm not thinking, and typically we use this as a tool to get to a derivative of time, right? So it was a segue point. Here in Lagrange, that, you know, that is the end game. It, it, it's, it's, all I'm after. I just want to know how does t vary with respect to theta. The next one, how does t vary with respect to theta dot. The next one, what's then the time derivative of this variation of t uh, change with respect to theta. So uh, it's probably the first time you've really seen that, and I very understandable question. But no, we're looking at those uniquely. You know, we did this twice. So here we got one equation for Lagrange, our Lagrange one equation. And here we got our Lagrange two equation, and they were written out. But we finished there. What I'd like to do now is um, pick up with that. I want to consider an applied force. And I mentioned on Tuesday. And I'll mention it again. This example is really helpful to me. I like this example, and I've got another one. I keep coming back to this one. It sort of it contains all the working parts of doing Lagrange. So when I'm solving you know problems using Lagrange, sometimes I say, oh, "Now, how did I? What was my numbering system? What do I have to do?" This example is really nice. It just it's simple, and it reminds me of those components. So now I'm going to add some force P sub T here to the second mass and their equivalent masses, but I'm gonna add it to the second one. So I wanna solve the same problem. I wanna solve this, so the equations of motion, via Lagrange. You know, I should, when we get this one done, I want to take a moment and compare and contrast with Newton, by the way. So what do we, so this is the problem we're going to solve. So we'll go through our same order. Step zero was the same as before. We get our Q. That doesn't change. Step one, you know, so step zero is the same. Step one, I think we said we got to get energies is how I've been saying it. Sometimes it's nice to have steps. Use them if it's helpful. Energies, did the energies change? Was my energy state the same or is it different? Well, uh, <laughs> Kevin, good question. Here, when I say energy, I'm really, for LeBron's, I'm wanting to write the kinetic and the so I'm adding a force, so clearly it's got to change the energy state in some way. So you say, well, only that'd be a good answer. Uh, conversely, when I was <coughs> really just interested in kinetic structure. So now that you've got me on that one, which I'm really asking to you, does it change kinetic or potential energy? For the 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 description of them. No, no. P's not gonna show up in either. So they're the same. All right, uh, then I think I said, let's go to the components. So if we look at the components, right, uh, I've got the partial of T with respect to theta. Let's think about those. The partial of T with respect to Q, partial of T with respect to Q dot. Do those change? Same. 
partial of V with respect to Q, it's the same. So what's going to change? The DDT, that's going to be, so what's going to change? Cap Q. Cap Q theta. Different. So in, in this example, adding that force, you know, only changes, the, it shows up with the Q. It shows up with the Q. Before I had it as zero. So everything will look the same. I'm going to, I'm not even going to rewrite what I had above. Everything's the same, so it's going to be a bunch of the same stuff, but I need a Q sub theta now, and I need a Q sub phi now. So I'm going to pick up there, and then once I get those, that Q theta, Q phi, I'll just tack it on to the equation. Oh. <coughs> oh. Sorry. So, Let's, at this point, we need to uh, carefully review our equation for Q. So let's, let's do that, remind ourselves again. So Q sub J, the way we had it written, Q sub J is the sum for I equal one to cap N, F sub I dotted with the partial of little r sub, r sub I, respect to Q J. That was our equation. Which means, let's step through this. So uh, for Q theta, I've got to have the force, you know, well, remember, I've got two bodies, right? N is two here. So for Q theta, I'm gonna have the force on body one. <coughs> dotted with the partial of, oh, by the way, that was meant to be an I. The partial of the vector going out to body one, respect to QJ, which is theta. Then I need the force acting on body two dotted with the partial of the vector going out to body two with respect to theta. And when I go to Q phi, it's gonna be the force on body one dotted with the partial of R on body one with respect to phi plus force on body two dotted with the partial of R on body two with respect to phi. Uh, so, so you do the partial Yes, because, yes. So let me draw a big line here. So on the left-hand side, my Q sub one is theta. On the right-hand side, my Q is B. And that's exactly right, Michael. And I'm considering, you know, I have to consider all bodies. I have to consider all the bodies. So the summation, I have to go over all the bodies. J, J, which is one of the identity. Yep. So let's look at our terms. Let's start with the, uh, let's start with the, uh, let's start with the forces there first, right? So what's my force on body one? Yes, it's zero. All right, I think we need to, well, and then, okay, let's finish this. Michael, you're on a roll. What's the force on body two? P. P. And it's a vector, so it's in the direction of C1. Is that right? Yeah, I assume it's, yeah, I assume it's always, is that C2? Eh. No, it's a one, yeah. Did I change that from Monday, Tuesday? Okay. Is it right now? Is this how I did it on Tuesday? Now? Okay. Yeah, that's my intention. Yeah, my my in my notes here, I've got a different way. So. Well, I'm gonna mess up something either way. This way, I have an excuse. That's right. Okay, so let's discuss this now. 
if I look at F1, you know, my head is so if I'm looking at one, um, I would say, well, I've got those tensions. Get the tension. Which, by the way, you can you could reduce. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that. Let's think about this. Okay. So well, let's think this all the way through. Right? Let's think. Yeah, yeah I did. Right. Yeah. So if I if I were to do a free body diagram. This is what M1 would look like, and this is what the other guy would look like, all right? So here's going to be my, uh, at this point, I'm going to use uh, my understanding of Lagrange to make this problem go as efficiently as possible. Let's start here. What about the MG? I didn't, we didn't write, well, what Michael suggested is correct. This is the, this is the answer that I'm asking. Michael, why did we not include MG? Because we didn't include it the first time. <laughs> why didn't we include it the first time? <laughs> You're right on. Why did we not include it the previous time? MG? Not MG. Not MG. Not MG. The Lagrange is, is you don't consider it's not it's not well, it's, it's not it's doing work yeah okay, so, so so you're jumping ahead we'll come back to it t1 and t2 are are, into, are constraints right they're workable that's my argument that it is because so they're working all right so it's a little on that t1 and t2 are workable hence we're gonna have to write them down T1 are workless constraints. That's the beauty of Lagrange. All right, Preston. Um, now you're talking now about MG, right? Yeah. Now what about MG? MG is not a constraint, huh? Yeah, MG's always down, but the thing's moving and there could be a component force in that direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, MG is not a constraint. MG is a conservative force, and well, why am I ignoring it? What am I not including? Why am I just completely not including my completely? And <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. So far, Ethan, you're you're batting 100. Potential. Remember, we said that uh, we introduced the potential function, the potential energy. And we said, well, there's a special class of forces that are conservative, meaning the force is a function of displacement only. T is kind of hard. I mean, T clearly is going to be a function of things going past or I can imagine that a different force. I don't know how I'd write T well. It would be hard to write T as a function, but T is going to be a function of velocity. But MG is only a function of its position. That's that force. It's only a function of accident. It's conservative. So we agreed, you know, now you could you could have chosen not to include it, but on that previous one, we said we're going to include all the conservative forces in our potential energy. So MG can already count for. Does that make sense to everybody? So we already accounted for MG. Already accounted for. <coughs> yeah. In V. And then the workless constraints we're going to ignore at this point because we're leaning on Lagrange. Now, you could, you know, now, could you have said included T here and then find out? Because by including T, you're going to just go back. You're basically rewriting those forces. You're rebooting them. So we wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be bad. If you included MG, the same thing, no, right? if you included MG, it would be physically wrong because you're double counting the full credit. All right, so that was our argument. So those are our forces, and those are going to show up both times. Next, we need the partial of R1 with respect to theta, and we need the partial of R2 with respect to theta. Now, I mentioned this, you know, I on Tuesday, I did some stuff in passing. You could do, take the partial of R with respect to theta 
R with respect to theta, what was R? That was uh, like L, it was negative LB1, correct? Look, you'll never do this again, but I do want to show you. Um, you could, R1 was negative LB1. Now you might say, well, look, the partial of minus LB1 with respect to theta is clearly zero because there's no theta in the cloud, right? But when we take these partials, we've got to use the same with these Newton dynamics, right? We've got to take them with respect to those derivatives, these are partials with respect to the initial state. So you'd have to do the same kind of trickery that we did when we took the derivative in time. So either describe it in the end frame, or you could use a, a model, you could use the transport in the end frame. Mm -hmm. okay. The particle width plus the angular velocity uh, variance. I recommend you don't do it, but I do want to point out that it's still there. You can still do this. Um, in general, we don't do it that way, but you could. Does that make sense what I just said? It, it, well, in general, I, I, I say I'm working with holonomic constraints, and so I'm going to use that cancellation of dots. So I'm going to say that the partial of R1 with respect to theta is equivalent to the partial of R1 dot with respect to theta dot. That's that little cancellation of dots theorem that I relied on for the derivation. The derivation was just for fun, right? But this is for real. So here, we need to make a big star. I'm going to make use of this because I'm going to have to do these partials. So at this point, when you see, when you're doing the generalized force, this is where it shows up. When you're doing the generalized force, you're going to have to take the partial of the displacements with respect to the cues. And that's hard to do. It could be done, but it's harder to do. So you'll want to use that cancellation of dots. It's not a theorem, it's just something that we use that equivalency to make our life easy. So the R1 dot was, uh, Kevin, remind me, that was L theta dot in the B, B2, B1 respect to theta dot. So that's just LB1. The velocity exposes it. The velocity exposes those terms that are taken. So why? I don't know. I'm not sure why. I'm still curious to look at it. It's going to be easier to look at. Next, we've got to take the partial of R2 with respect to theta 2. So I'm going to take the partial of R2 dot with respect to theta 2 dot. R2 dot was, I'm peeking up, L theta dot. Here, let's just look up here briefly. You've got it in your notes. So I need the partial of R2 with respect to theta 2. And this is going to take a little work. I'll get an L, well, I'll get an L, an L plus an L cos B in my, um, yeah, my B1 direction, and Oh, yeah, here, let's, it, this is good to review. Guys, at any point, this is a good time to be practicing that math stuff because we're on a course where we need to, <laughs> we need to have it. So it's good to review. So we had an L theta dot plus B dot cos phi, and we were taking the partial with respect to theta dot here. So in this case, you could just expand that. There would be a couple ways. You could just expand that out. But here's what I'm going to do, Michael. I'm going to say it's the constants L cos phi times the partial with respect to theta dot of theta dot plus phi dot. And that's going to be a partial, partial theta dot, which is 1, plus partial phi dot, which is 0. 
I think you see that. Now, what if, just as an aside, since you brought it up, what if that was squared? Well, I shouldn't have rephrased that. If it's squared, again, I'll have my constants times the partial of this thing squared, which is going to be uh, two times this thing times the DDT or the DD theta of that thing. Makes sense. So I'll write it down. It's going to be L cos phi, two times theta dot plus phi dot times then the partial of theta dot of theta dot plus phi dot, which is just one. Probably, yeah. So if those two terms, there's going to be a little bit of work involved. So let's now plug them in. So I've got F1 Right, this is going to take just a tad bit of work, right? So I've got uh, 0 dotted with my LB1 plus P in the C1 dotted with L plus L cos phi in the B1 plus L sine phi in the B2. So I have to do, you know, what we're good at doing, but I've got to convert one frame or the other. So let me convert this guy from the C frame to the B frame. So the projection from the C frame to the B frame was just that uh, rotation around the three by a phi. So I think it's gonna be cos phi minus sine phi zero, sine phi cos phi zero, 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 one times P zero, zero. This is my rotation from the projection from the C back to the B. So I'm gonna get a cos phi P, I'm gonna get a sine phi P, and a zero dotted with an L plus L cos phi, an L sine phi, and a zero. And those are both in the B frame. So one more time, I'll get a zero for the first term. I'll get a uh, L times cos phi plus cos phi squared plus L sine phi squared P. Or I can rewrite this one more time. It looks like I'm gonna get L times one plus cos phi P. Give me a second. Check my work. That's my equivalent. This is my generalized force. This is really interesting. It's my generalized force. We call it a force, but then that force component has energy components. Um, but I kind of think of it as a force. Uh, yeah. Now, lucky me, I get to do the same thing again. 
They're going to do it for phi. Now the forces are the same, same of argument. Forces don't change. Uh, the the uh, I need the partial. I need my R's now, so let's come down here. So my partial of R1 with respect to phi, which is the partial R1 dot with respect to phi1 dot, is zero. So phi there. And then the uh, partial of R2 dot with respect to phi dot, because see, I'm replacing. I'm saying that's the partial of R2 with respect to phi is equivalent. That's my cancellation of dots. And I think at that point, I get a, uh, let's see, I get an L cos, I think I just get an L cos phi in the B1 plus an L sine phi in the B2. Does that look right? L sine phi in the B2? Okay. I'm going to scroll up for a second and look at my velocity again. So here's my velocity. And I'm taking derivative with respect to P dot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, L cos P times the derivative of that. And then L sine P times the derivative of that. L cos P L sine P. And I uh, do the dot product, so I get my Q phi is zero plus my, you know, P in the C1, which I'm just going to write since I've already converted it. It's cos phi, P, sine phi, P, and zero. Oh, this is going to be instructive. Maybe. Maybe not. Dotted with Preston, are you ready for something exciting? I am. Okay. It's coming. So, you see what I'm doing here? I'm just now talking. This is F1 dotted with the partial bar of the P. This is F2 dotted with the partial R2 of the P. I just pulled this from here. So, I can see when I put those together, I'm going to just do that math in my head. I get cos p squared plus sine p squared times L times P or L P. And now I plug those into my Lagrange. So on the left hand side, I get, you know, all the stuff from before. Equals L one plus cos phi p, and my other equation dot 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 from before equals L p. Is that work to write down from before? This is from previous prop from previous example. Yeah. Did I get you? Yeah. Yeah, but previously, before Q theta equals zero. So now you're just going to plug in that term because we, we've already said the energy, the T, the V, the partials, those are all the same. Yeah, we All right, Preston, here, here's the thing I got excited about. You're probably not going to be quite as appreciative. But um, yeah. Well, here, Preston, before I do that, 
So a force P acting here, you know, this force P acting out here on this body, there's a couple things that are exciting. Well, Preston, let's look at it together, okay? I've got P acting on body two, right? And in a way, body two, I mean, it's not acting on body one. Now, J1 wasn't necessarily referring to body one, but you might say, well, it's only acting on body two, so it's only going to affect you. That's the way it's been used, right? So we have P on body one. But in LeBron, I'm trying to find the generalized force. What's the equivalent force? You know, what's the equivalent of the generalized force? So, I, so first of all, I, I wouldn't assume that it's not going to flow from this. The second thing that's a little instructive, now if I had a force, you know, if I added a second force here, we could have done that, right? Add some P, add some Q force here, and be the same idea. I think at this point, it'd be straightforward to do. You would just, where we had zeros, we would just add the Q down below, or whatever term. The second thing, this is what I got excited about, Preston, was if I have a, if I have a term that's acting directly in direct coordination with my generalized variable, then this this generalized force exposes it directly. Uh, that didn't make any sense. Let me let me try to explain what I'm thinking by way of example. Here I've got a theta. So a directly related generalized force for the location we have a moment, right? So if I would have had a moment show up here, if I would have applied a moment here, right, like some M1, that's gonna show up, because that goes hand in hand with the general force, that's gonna show up, that's gonna show up in the general force, right? And then similarly, same thing, same thing here. Now in this case, my generalized coordinate was a C, this location, I had a force C, but you can see that the equivalent generalized force was C times L. Yeah. Now that I've thrown it out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the it's the um yeah, it's a good point. So it's LP, it's the moment on the second one plus LP modified by cos phi, right? Yeah. Well, P, well, the direction is in the sign of P. So here, a positive P means it's going in the C1 direction, kind of like we talked about before, um, that direction thing. All right. This example I like because when I have forces, it helps me keep track of where they show up. Any questions on this? All right, I'm 10 minutes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, 15, I'm 15 minutes off, 13 minutes off. So let's uh, move, questions, other questions, comments? One, one quick question. Yeah. So we were riding Q in matrix A. We got B1, B2, B3. Yep. So you can, you can. Oh, no, Q, no, no, Q. Michael, Q was the result of a dot product, right? Q was, F1 dotted, F dotted with this one, and F, so that when, when we do the dot product, we move to the red. Yeah, 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 so that's why you can add the sign of that. That's why you can add, and, and let me, you know, that's a big, that is a big deal. So kind of remember the dot product by its other name, which is Scale product. Here's your scale. The dot product always uses a scale, always yields a scale. And then the, the cross product has its other name, its alias, which is um, the vector product. So you don't use that out. Lastly, I was going to take a little time. You might, well, I was going to take a few minutes to say, what, how would we treat this with Newton Euler? Well, if we treat it with Newton Euler, we Free body diagrams with two point masses effectively, we'd have six equations, right? Three for each. Eh, four equations, I suppose. You could ignore moments. Well, I mean, it technically you'd have six equations, but a minimum of four, and you'd have the two tension forces and the two motion, two, two motions, and they would be coupled. Here, notice we have explicitly two equations on just the motion. They're they're 
we've eliminated all those constraint forces directly from our equations. So if you had to go through the effort of doing Newton and then somehow solving explicitly for the two angles, that could be really challenging. I mean, at the minimum, you've got that matrix here and have to invert symbolically. So Lagrange, you know, in the process, I think was probably less steps just to get these equations, but if you've got to the same set of equations, guaranteed it's going to be less steps. For sure. You were going to comment. So one more time, the beauty of Lagrange is we were able to ignore the constraint forces the entire time. And we didn't have to go all the way to acceleration. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Pondering, you're pondering my great thoughts, you know, when I said scalar product. I really. pondering product up there while you were talking about down here. Yeah. So the. Before, when we wrote out the two equations, they were equal to zero. Now they're going to equal to this, uh, these two, two things. <clears throat> because they, they always equal q theta, but in the previous example, the q theta is zero right. because the forces are zero. We didn't make it feel like I could have said, you know, here are the forces, the p's and mg, where did they go? I didn't. I just said they're zero. You said, okay. Uh, but this time we, we broke them down and said, where are they? No problem. No problem. Uh, yeah. Has, has someone done this for like a long time? Yeah. Can you just look at the problem and say, oh, I'm going to do this by one method or the other method? Let's see that how you do it. Yeah, to some degree. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here's here would be the quick question. If you, the Lagrange did the constraints, Newton. It brings the constraints right up in front of your face, right? You can't get rid of them. It's three by diagram, and first thing, you all the way to shape. So if I had a problem where I, I wanted to ignore the constraints, I didn't want to, I just wanted to, I just want to understand the motion of this problem. Then Lagrange is going to get you there. I don't want to say it's bad, always the best possible, book, but in general, best. <laughs> Alternatively, if I'm setting up a problem and I really want it, I want to know those constraint forces. Maybe I'm given the motion and I want to solve the constraint, but Newton set up to solve all this. Here. So right off the bat, that would be the easy check. The second thing is we've got a guy Pedersen. I don't know John Pedersen. John Pedersen doesn't believe in check. And uh, so he, he and, and uh, which is to say that he solves every problem in the world using Newton's method, and every problem in the world could be solved with Newton's method. Other people, you know, I tend to like Lagrange, so I tend to go Lagrange first. If uh, I want to, so so I guess two answers. If you've got constraint forces, I'd probably just use Newton. Although you can get them with the bond. I'll show you later a little bit. If you just want motion, I'd probably go with the bond. And then thirdly, you might have a crucial question. So if you're saying designing, right? Oh, you're gonna want all those well, forces. yeah. Well, yeah. You, you know, okay. We're, going to, we're investing a lot of time in this class. You know, the big thing that I teach you is the analytical method. Well, there's two big things. One is how to deal with test key location figures. But you need that regardless. And then analytics. So I'm trying to make a, a case for LeBron. So, sure, that is the case. However, LeBron also, and I'm going to show you method. LeBron could expose the constraints for you. I'd have to show you another method. And you can do them one at a time. Now, if you said, I just want every, if I just want every possible force, every possible motion, then, you know, that's what Newton does. Uh, but the other benefit, I'll tell you the other benefit with um, Lagrange, and, and, and this is, you know, Lagrange is natural in doing it. It's not that you couldn't do it with Newton, but Lagrange is a little more natural. And that is this concept of working with general algorithm. So, uh, since you've asked, and this is a, we've got in a topic that I'm interested in. So, I've been I've been doing a lot of uh, mobile mobile robotics mobile mobile manipulators. Uh, for example, right now we've got a project where we've got a sixth off arm on a mobile manipulator. We're automating welding. So it's through the Navy. And so anyhow, I've been I've been interested in this problem for a while. So I've got a, a two off. I've got you know left right. They happen to be tracks on these current machines. So I've got you know a, a theta one and a theta two. 
and then a sixth off manipulator. So six degrees of freedom there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I, I, I've been building these robots for so literally 50 different robots. In there. So that was for a montage of that. Six or eight of them that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's what we do. We do climbing robots. But, you know, they tend to have a lot of that. Anyhow, when you start, to, if you start thinking about how, you know, I'm interested in how the torch moves out here. So out here, I've got a torch and a spark, you know, a sparking away. So, you know, how do I want to describe that motion? You know, I could describe it with uh, Newton, the sort of the, the natural way is to use X, Y, Z and rotation, you know, from, from a to step to do that. But for me, I, I need to be thinking of robotics. I need to be doing joint level control. I've got eight joints, and I've got to be doing joint level control on each of them. So if I could pass this space into a space that was really joint, the theta, if I could write this one completely the theta, that would make a lot more sense to me. Now, these thetas, you know, the angle of this elbow in no way is related to this. So it's not obvious how that's related to the x axis. You have to be a so I, I could write it easy that way, but it wouldn't be obvious. With regard to screen wise, I just write the energy in terms of this point. So a lot of times in robotics, the bond is preferred because I can write in what we call joint space. It's not directly the X, Y, Z coordinates, but it's a very natural way to write. So third answer. I need that. I, I, you know me. Once you get me going, I don't stop. <laughs> So a lot of roboticists like Newton, particularly mobile robotics, like like Lagrange, uh, because I can write the motion in terms of the joint, which is where I want to be ultimately. I do it straight away. So the point is write the motion with Lagrange, and then you can write it with the other way. Yeah. So the quick way, the way you get the forces, the way you code the forces. Is you relax them. If you imagine every force is a constraint. And so LeBron drew up that the, well, the constraints, the force there is the force that it would take to enforce the no motion constraint. So the quick the quick way of exposing that force is to add a variable to oh well guess what? In the uh, pendulum, for example, in the pendulum problem. Those constraints were hidden. Well, if I want to get that, if I want to get this thing, I say, oh, I want that tension. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to relax the constraints of this one here. I'm going to add a new variable. And that variable is going to be the linear motion of this thing. Okay? And that will now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, C can cause some work. It's going to do C times the displacement. I'll set up the problem. Now, in reality, it doesn't move. So at the very end, I'll go back and say, oh, by the way, this motion can't move. So what's the force that would that's the tendency to be exposed to the most of those. So I would add a pseudo, a pseudo motion for every force I want to find. It's a, yeah, well, now we're using virtual in a different way. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, an artificial, it's an artificial displacement, a temporary displacement, uh, yeah. Good, other discussion, LeBron? All right, we're now going to go to Lagrange for rigid bodies. Right. Uh, well, none. <laughs> yeah, Preston. Okay, so here's what we are going to do. I'm going to boogie. I'm going to get through my. We're not going to get to any examples. I'm going to boogie through. I want to get through this theory uh, of setting it up. You know, and and like all the theory, you're never. You're not going to re-derive this, but. It's, it's it's what you do, right? You're you're in grad school. It's what you do. I'm sorry. There's got to be a better way, but I don't know it. So, at the moment we're going to redrive it. The nice thing is this derivation is going to look just like what we did when we were deriving Newton Euler, and it's going to show some things. And uh, you know, I even looked at this and said, well, do I want to take the time to derive this? And there are a few things that are instructive out of it. So let's do that. All right. Lagrange for rigid bodies. We didn't really write down a picture of a particle and went through. We just assumed we had, we assumed a particle, we assumed Newton's laws, and we and then we wrote virtual work, D'Alembert, and then we said Lagrange said this, and we went back and said, well, are they equal? And we showed they're equal. 
with Lagrange, with uh, the rigid body though, we're gonna write out a rigid body. So we've got this rigid body, we've got some little particle of little mass, dm here. Uh, we have a point G, somewhere on the body, I'm gonna call it capital G at the moment, like I did before. So I've got some vector R cap G, some little r, and some r cap uh, p. This is my end frame. It'll be a body fixed frame. So previously with Newton Euler, we set this thing up, right? And then we said, well, let's come mostly set up. and we then integrate it over the body. We're gonna do the same thing, but we're not doing Newton, we're doing Lagrange. So what do we need to do? Well, we're gonna write the kinetic energy associated with that particle. And it's a little dm, so it's gonna give us a little dt. So the kinetic energy of that differential partial particle is one half r sub p dollar rp times dm. I put dm last because you can see I'm gonna integrate uh, the total kinetic energy, of course, is the integral of that energy, which is the uh, integral of RP dotted with RP. Yeah. By the way, I forgot my dots. Gosh. Which is integral one half, I guess I can pull the half out. So RP is RG plus little r dotted with itself. So now let's start breaking down the components. So I'm going to get, and I could expand that out, but let's, let's work from here. Uh, let's look through each term. So the first one is this RG dotted with RG velocity. And RG is independent of, of the mass, so I can pull it out. So I'm going to get the first term is one half. RG dotted with RG times the integral of dm, which is just the mass. Next, I'm going to get two of these terms, 2 times 1 half times the uh, integral of RG dot dotted with little r. And I'm going to pull the RG dot out. Yep. And then the third term is going to be one half the integral of little r dotted with itself. Now let's look at these three terms. Um, um, well, actually, uh, yeah, let's look at these three terms. So the first term gives us just one half RG vector dot dotted with RG vector dot times mass, or one half M. Let's put the M first, because that's what we usually do. One half MR squared. <clears throat> the second term is okay the second term i'm going to replace the the i forgot the dot here note for a rigid body that little r dot the derivative of little r there's going to be two terms right it's going to be the derivative of r itself plus then the angular velocity of R in its local frame crossed with it. The, for a rigid body, little r itself doesn't change. So I just get, that's equal to omega b to n crossed with R.
So that's my first term. So my second term gives me this RG vector dot. No, cross with R. Here, here it's cross with R. That's just our velocity. So I've got little r described in a local plane. The derivative is no. <clears throat> Okay, my second term, I get two times one half. Now I'm doing the second term. Two times one half, that's one. RG vector dot dotted with now the integral of omega cross R. The omega is independent of the body. So I pull it out times the integral of R D M. That's cross. And then the third term is one half integral of omega cross R dotted with omega cross R. Now, I'm going to take a, a side. There are two cases we can consider. If uh, G is the center of mass, Then, uh, then the integral of R D M equals zero. If G is a fixed point, which by the way, you notice, I don't like to use, but I'm just showing it here for completeness, then this R G dot vector dot equals zero. <clears throat> In either case, the second term goes to zero. Uh, the first guy we've already made explicit if it's the center, if G is the center of mass. Oh, excuse me. If G is a fixed point, that goes to zero. We're going to treat it as a center of mass. So we now need to look at this third term. <clears throat> so now we need to consider this uh, term one half integral of omega cross r dotted with omega cross r. So here, you know, we've seen, you know where this is going, right? You've seen this before. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we did this, we did this before. It, you remember I got real excited and we, we, we wrote stuff for like two hours. I said, this is going to be so exciting. We wrote, 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 and then I said, look at this. Remember that? Oh, oh. See, I knew you remembered it. Okay. Here, okay, I'm gonna for, I'm gonna skip the two hours of writing. Remember this thing leads to uh, an I. This thing leads to the mass moment of inertia is where this these go. In this case, it's gonna give it a it's gonna lead us to an omega dotted with uh, an I omega is where this is gonna go. All right, let me just show you a step or two. I'll tell you what, we'll we will not spend more than five minutes. See if we can get to this guy. So we're going to first use our uh, scalar triple product. See, I got to justify you learning that in eighth grade or whatever grade you learned scalar triple product. I don't think you learned it there. I think you probably learned it in calc, calc one or something. Because of that, for some reason, this is why. I knew that someday you'd be sitting here. Scalar triple product. Now I'm going to write it kind of this way. A dot. Before I wrote it in my back minus cab format, but now I'm going to write it this way. So A dot over B cross C equals 
cross a. Sorry, it's a variation of the back minus tab rule, but I'm going to write it this way. <clears throat> so if we let a equal omega cross r, b equal omega, c equal little r, and uh, if you note, I'm kind of dropping the vectors signs for late because of laziness. Then <clears throat> we can rewrite this thing as um, this omega cross r dotted with omega cross r can be rewritten as omega times the integral of r cross omega cross r. Oops. Yeah. Then we're going to uh, our triple vector product. Which is the um, you know the back minus cap. So A cross B cross C equals back B And when we do this, okay, so we're getting this, um, there was a one half here. I just added a one half. So we get one half omega integral r cross omega cross r gives us one half omega integral omega times r dot r minus r times r dot omega. Okay. So now I'm gonna short circuit this. If you let r equal some rx b1, plus ry b2 plus rz b3 and omega equal omega 1 b1 plus omega 2 b2 plus omega 3 b3. And you plug all that in, you're gonna get, you'll get with, you know, some amount of work, one half omega dotted with the integral y squared plus z squared, x squared plus z squared, x squared plus y squared. And then you get these off diagonal terms like an x negative xy and then terms here dotted with omega. DM. <clears throat> and this thing is that is I, our inertia tensor or inertia matrix. Yeah, there's there's the the one that we pulled out early on. So that's the and we pulled that out of the integral because omega is a function of r. So if you integrate over the body, it doesn't have function. And then you know when we did that triple vector product, that led us right to form this letter, which is by definition the inertia matrix. And that's got a top there with uh two by three hundred and two positive. 
Let's pull out the dot there. That's just a multiplication. Okay, so that means, so here's the punchline. Two minutes late. Oh yeah, they loved it. They, no, 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 no. No, no. Well, we, um, you know, when we did Newton Euler, we expanded out and we got those crazy, you know, R plus omega plus omega plus R plus alpha plus. You know, we got those coins. And then that gave us some theory. So we did the exact same thing. It uh, starts from a very different spot. So no. No. Nope, Kevin. You're still, you're, you're definitely on par with those. Yeah, who's at a minimum. Uh, all right, so when you pull all this together, that says, and here's, here's why I did this. That says that T is one half M RG dotted with RG. That now looks like I've gone to a lowercase g. Not sure why. Yeah, yeah, same g. Uh, plus omega dot i omega. I'm gonna put this in the cloud because it's very important. I was, I've been putting stuff on the cloud before the cloud even existed. So, we, uh, <coughs> well, I was going to say, ask testing, you, you know, you just don't need to know that. So, before we had this equal one at M, you said, the particle, so you get the now, the body, you could say, you get one at M, and then you got to say, and then you got to Okay. And, and, okay, so you do this, and then continue as normal. And, Continue as normal. You just take derivatives. Does continue as normal? Is that a helpful thing to write down? I remind I say that to myself a lot. Continue as normal. Usually when my wife's screaming, I just say, you know, just continue as normal. But then she reminds me that's what got me normal me is what got me into that mess. So anyhow. So you write T and then you just take the partials and carry on. Now, if we look at, uh, let's, uh, you know, I'd love to talk about this. I, I could go on and on and on, but you guys don't let me. So I do, I want to finish Lagrange. So V is the same. Oh, do recall that G is the center of mass. Well, actually, I do need to say this. I'm going to get done with Lagrange today. G is the center of mass. All right. G could also be a fixed point. And by fixed, oh, I almost right, fixed picks, fixed point. By fixed, I mean inertially fixed, okay? I don't do that. I use G as the center of mass. In the derivation, can you choose some other spot? No, because that was an assumption we made in the derivation. We said either it's a center of mass or it's a fixed point. That drove that term to zero. So you've got to choose one, you got to choose one or the other. And I recommend you choose center of mass. That's what I see if you're going I mean, I suppose you could, you could use a fixed point. And I was written in, is in, uh, is in uh, body fixed coordinates. And it's about the uh, centroid. Unless, of course, <clears throat> you chose that G to be the fixed point, then you have to do it about that. The same argument as before, don't forget that. So, you get T this way, continue as normal. V, you know, V doesn't change. V, what about V? V is the same as before, it's just the, uh, It's just the uh, potential, it's the potential. Um, and 
uh, we're treated the same as before. Now, what about the generalized force? Now we need to consider Now, Q sub J, we need to go back and revisit. So, guess what? Here we go. There's a little body. So I got some little mass P, of mass dm, got some vector RP, and our Q sub J uh, is going to be the integral over the body of the little infinitesimal force acting on P dotted with the partial of R of little RP with respect to Q sub J. Now I'm going to choose a reference point, and this time I'm calling it A. Yeah. This one does not have to be the centroid. This one can be arbitrary. So I'm not going to use G uh, A. So I'm going to pick a reference point, which is A. And I'm, a, I'm going to rewrite RP as consisting of two terms, R A and R. So when I do that, I can rewrite Q sub J as the integral df <clears throat> dotted with the partial with respect to qj of my r sub a plus r. No, yeah, and you know what? This is a case, in every other case we've considered, I said the center mass. This is a case where the center of mass doesn't buy you much. This is a case where really this really can be arbitrary. I'll say does not have to be center of mass. But it's going to make sense if you just solve all the other problems and have all the Yeah, that's my that's my rule. When in doubt, I just work around the center of mass. Um, but this is a case where I don't think it buys you much. We'll we'll uh, yeah. This one can be arbitrary. So now we get uh, two integrals. We get df dotted with the partial of r sub a with respect to uh, oh oh you know what okay with respect to qj uh, plus the integral df uh, with partial of R now this guy is RA doesn't change over the body so this term just becomes F dotted with the partial of RA with respect to QJ because RA is independent of the body is A integrate over the body little RA doesn't change RA does not change over body, you know, as I integrate over body. So I can just, so I can just pull the integral, or I can pull the partial out, so I just get the integral of dF over the body, which is F. Now, this term, yeah, this term takes a little more work. I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to rewrite this as df dotted with the partial of r dot with respect to qj dot. So here I use my cancellation of dots. That little thing that all of a sudden we've been using a bunch now. And r dot. Uh, for a rigid body is going to be equal to RB respect to N crossed with R. We said that, we kind of did that a minute ago. Being sloppy with my vector signs, I know. 
We did that a minute ago. We said that R doesn't change length, so it only changes angle. So when I plug that in, I get the integral of dF dotted with the partial with respect to qj of omega cross with r. All right. So, Kevin, you remember seeing this before? Okay, good. So we're going to do our usual stuff. Do our usual, which is, you know, triple, you know, we're going to, here we're going to do, actually, this one's not too hard. If you just apply the triple scalar product, and I'm not going to do all of it, but uh, which is A dot B cross C equals B dot C crossed with A. Then we can replace this and rewrite this as follows. Um, look, if we let A equal BF, if we let A equal BF, if we let B equal omega, we C equal R, we can rewrite this as omega dotted with R cross. So we'll rewrite this term as um, follows. The integral of partial omega with respect to Q sub J, we're almost done, dotted with R cross DF. And um, F dotted with a partial of R A with respect to Q J. So why don't you have to do the partial of R with respect to Q J? Oh, wh where? Um, so you may. C R. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we let C, okay, let A equal F, B equal omega, C equal R, so I get B, the, so that's the part, oh, 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 oh. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Okay. Let me back up. Yeah. Cause I did that quickly. So where did I make that change? Re right here. I did it. Um, so here, let's, let me pull over here for just a moment. So what I'm after is I'm after the partial of R dot with respect to QJ dot. And so um, I'm going to get that uh, my R dot consists of omega crossed with R. So it's going to be the partial of omega crossed with R. So you're okay with that, Preston. And then uh, QJ dot. and Omega is a velocity term, so it's going to have Q dots in it, but R is a length term. It's not going to have Q dots in it, so it will be independent. That's all you need to say. So that equals omega respect to QJ dot crossed with R. Yeah, that's what I did. And then down here, let me do one other sleight of hand. I'm going to move that integral here because omega does, is not a function of the body. So I just get the integral of the body of R dF. That is the moment on the body 
about point A. And so that lets me rewrite this QJ, and here comes my cloud. QJ equals F dotted with the partial of RA with respect to QJ plus the moment about A dotted with the partial of omega with respect to QJ. Now this one has to be QJ dot. And this is the angular velocity of the body with respect to the inertial frame. So when I had a little thought, there's two chains. Okay. Let's get, yeah, we're going to have that down. So Lagrange for rigid bodies. I have to do two things. Number one, I have to modify my definition for the kinetic energy. Got the velocity, linear velocity, main angular velocity, somewhat as expected. But this accounts for 3D motion. You know, you, you were used to the idea of I omega squared, but in 3D motion, you have to do the omega dotted with I omega. And the other changes we have to consider are general coordinates to allow this moment to transform. So before we had just this particle, now that we can allow moments, we have uh, the forces acting on the body, dotted with the plus the moment acting on the body at about point A. So, you know what's interesting here? Look, the A shows up here. You know, so you say, well, why does it matter? You know, because that's not a function of A. It's just this little R up here. So whatever point that you're going to find the velocity of that body, Michael was saying, well, what's this going to say in that? He could be saying, well, I have this. That's the only one that's going to It makes sense to find the moment that's going to say that. That would be nice. But this is a case where, you know, really there's no stipulation that we're going to so those two changes, uh, that's all you need for LeBron. So I did not do our example. Somewhere I lost 45 minutes. Um, I've got two minutes left to say a word. Uh, we kind of talked about MATLAB. So I've got examples. There's one more thing I'm going to show you. So when we get together on Tuesday, I'm going to work some, uh, I'll work some uh, rigid body examples. And I do want to show you, uh, give you a big idea of kind of, so the thing is LeBron, So that's the bottom. So very powerful. We get we need to work more examples. We're gonna find a few more days of examples, and I want to show you one of the things is Lagrange multiplier. Lagrange multiplier are gonna allow you to start solving now from this bunch of very, very interesting problems. We'll just turn out to I, it, there's not a lot to deriving Lagrange multipliers to something to do, but we'll spend it entirely on that. This is Lagrange. Um, I'm gonna post uh some homework problems i'll get those posted uh you can get started on those as soon as you want so i'll i'll do that today and i need to post a statement on the um uh matlab problem uh, we'll post those two things okay going forward what do we still need to do i, I want to do the blog multiplier but i'm wanting to do some uh at least spend more time practicing and then doing uh computer applications so we're Getting, the good news is we're getting into the theory, which is that means it's like three answers. Three answers? Maybe? Two more weeks? Two more weeks in a day? Okay, so we're winding down. So, okay, so the other big theory thing, there's a bunch of little theory things. I want to show you a large multiplier. I want to practice problems. I want to be getting on uh, doing uh, uh, numerical evaluation. But anyway, that's where the weeks are going to be. Sure. Yeah.